Hi, my name is Simon Powers, and what you're about to watch is a lesson taken from a five-part course on Domenico Scarlatti's A Major Sonata K208. It's from the membership at Classical Guitar Corner Academy, and if you enjoy the lesson, you might want to find out more about membership at classicalguitarcorner.com. I hope you find it useful, and I hope you enjoy this piece as much as I do. What is it that makes this piece so exquisitely beautiful, so expressive? Well, I believe there are two main areas we can think about here. One is going to be the music that we're given by this master composer, Domenico Scarlatti. We get music full of expressive dissonances, syncopation, and interesting harmonic movement. What we bring to the table, however, in our interpretation is how to shape the line, where to give accents and maybe even rubato, stretching the time when we do get those dissonance notes, how to make the most out of the expressive notes uh, and the syncopation as well. So in this walkthrough, I want to talk about the interpretation aspects of the Scaletti Sonata. We start off with what is going to be an A major arpeggio. But Scaletti throws in an F sharp here. which is immediately expressive because it's a non-chordal tone. It doesn't fit into the A major triad of A, C sharp, and E. That F sharp then might give us time to put a little bit of stretch on it in terms of time, a little bit of a pause, holding back a little more weight, perhaps with a, a rest stroke, a very light rest stroke, maybe some vibrato in the right and the left hand. All of these are tools that we can use in our interpretation to add expressivity to this already quite expressive moment. One thing I will say about this particular F sharp and also some notes in the second measure is that in my edition and several guitar editions, you'll see this rhythm written out. But in the original version written for keyboard, these were actually written as appoggiaturas. Appoggiaturas mean a leaning note. It's a, a lean, where one note has a tension and then it relaxes into the following note. What they're commonly mistaken for is an achacatura, which is like a grace note. Well, it's not like a grace note, it is a grace note. And so we don't, I didn't want to make any confusions about how to play this rhythm, so I actually wrote it out, as many have chosen to do in guitar editions in the past. But do note that in these first two measures, the notes are actually written as appoggiaturas. So as we start, we have a nice steady pulse to get us going, maybe a little bit of uh, extra emphasis on that F sharp, we want to set a nice steady pulse from the beginning. We have these straight quarter notes, which become incredibly important throughout because they both provide a platform for the syncopation to make an effect, but they also offer us really nice flexible material to have an accelerando or a ritardando or just a little bit of rubato here and there throughout the music. In terms of the fingering here, we have a lot of different options, and it really is going to be up to the performer's interpretation to decide what's best. So for instance, if we used first position fingering, there's something about the first string which is usually a little more punchy on the classical guitar, and also just that open string sound, we can't actually put any vibrato on even if we wanted to. So there's a couple of reasons to put it on a second or a third string. If we start in first position and then come up the same second string, we might actually get, which isn't very stylistic, but it can be very expressive. Uh, in my edition, we're up here in the fifth position. So everything is nice and close for the left hand. But these kind of choices are gonna really make the difference between your version and somebody else's. A nice example of this fingering choice uh, is at the beginning of the second measure, jumping from B to F sharp. Now, there's a lot of stepwise movement in this piece, so we have movement like, 
movement without a leap of uh, an interval in between, rather stepping between scale degrees. But here we go from B to an F sharp, a perfect fifth, a very beautiful open sounding interval. And on the guitar, we don't have to do anything for these intervals. You know, it's just putting a finger down and playing a string. But if you were to sing this, the larger a leap is, the more we actually have to prepare, almost like we're gonna physically leap or jump. We have to prepare our body before going there. So one expressive tool here is to almost imitate the feeling of difficulty when there in fact absolutely isn't on the guitar. We wanna make it sound like there's some effort being made to go as opposed to just, you know, one note after the other. Yum, bum, almost like you're preparing your vocal cords to go up that fifth. So we can detach it a little bit or we can uh, use the waiting, yeah. Whatever molding of that interval you wanna do, you just don't make it thoughtless. Put some thought into it, put some shaping into it, and some expression. Also vibrato here. will add a lot of beauty to this already very delicate falling line. Moving on, we have this gentle cascade of notes and now we start to really get our first interaction with these uh, syncopated rhythms that permeate the whole piece and it has this lovely lilting effect so we don't want to deny that effect by playing anything too coarsely you know we really want to shape it like it's gently falling and it has a sense of release leap. Excuse my singing. <laughs> but we do want to differentiate between these leaps and this stepwise motion, especially when it's cascading down in a relaxed fashion like that. So let's listen again to the first two measures. Expressive. Leap. Letting go. Now, here in the second and third beat of measure three, uh, I actually provided, I believe, no, I did provide, no, there's a couple of fingerings which I, I changed in the way I play it into the way I put in the edition. The reason being the, the fingerings that I use are a little bit stretchy, uh, but I do it because it allows me to sustain those notes, for instance, on the second string here. In the edition, I've given it an open string, but if you like, you can go, stretch and then play that E on the second string it allows for vibrato it allows for a very similar tone palette as as opposed to which is a different sounding uh, note because it's an open string and then also here I can often use either one one or one two there to really encourage that yearning feel of these chromatic notes we went over this in the score analysis and these notes are accented dissonances. That means that we're hitting a non-chordal tone and in, in this case, a very crunchy dissonance there. So we want to exaggerate that tension to relaxation, that dissonance to consonance by playing essentially the first note louder, the dissonance louder, and then relaxing it as it comes back to consonance. And that will help us give the expressive nature to this line. As we move through this measure, measure four, we suddenly have 16th notes. And as we have these 16th notes uh, in each beat, we suddenly get an energy that wasn't there before. And this is a good opportunity to accelerate a little bit in terms of your tempo and add some movement uh, to the passage. So, one uh, way to make sure that that has an effect is not to mess around too much with the tempo or the, the beats that have come before. One thing that does happen a lot in this uh, kind of piece is that we will distort the pulse with those steady quarter notes 
but if we do it too much, it's like having cherries all over the cake. We just want a couple of cherries so that we can savor the moments where we really do pull and push the tempo. So um, we've had... Exaggerating a little bit there, but pushing through to a third beat and then relaxing back off in the tempo. As we head back down to the home key of A major. So already in the first four measures, we've got kind of a complete phrase or idea there uh, where we've had expressive notes, we've had uh, leaps that we bring out using fingering and vibrato, we have a gentle cascading scale there in measure two, accented dissonances, and now a set of sixteenths which we might use to uh, push and pull the tempo for expressive purposes. So already a lot of expressive tools that we are adding to this already exquisite music. Moving on now, uh, measure five through uh, the first beat of measure nine is sort of another section unto itself. And we encounter similar material, but it's more agitated, it's more dissonant, uh, more interesting harmonically, and also getting a bit more syncopated. So as we'll find with this section and the B section as well, we have an increased uh, level of activity, both harmonic dissonance uh, and rhythmic activity all the way towards the end, which gives us a great sense of relief and arrival at the end of each section. So um, we've started. And all the little ornaments I'm adding in, I will talk about that later on in the course. But here we have some really outstanding, literally and uh, figuratively, uh, outstanding notes. So that D sharp, you'll hear it's almost like a persistent dissonance that finally gives way in measure seven. So have a listen. There it is. There. And then finally goes down to that C sharp. So we have kind of a forward motion there. We have the, a similar uh, moment that happens in the second section, in the B section, where we have... You know, we don't have to make too much of it, but I think it gives shape to these four measures so we can make a longer idea out of it instead of just thinking beat to beat. Uh, so all in all, you know, as we, that persistence goes with that D sharp and the harmony gets a little more dissonant towards measure seven and then relaxes, we can also increase the dynamic, do a, a crescendo and maybe some um, more heavily accented notes and perhaps even on a cello rondo. So let's have a listen. There's a roll. Crescendo. down at E major, we've modulated now. But you can see how there's, you know, in a four bar phrase, we really just have a nice arc between the first and second. Let me play from the beginning, just so we can hear that nice four bar phrase arc, uh, and hearing again the different tools we use along the way. Nice and simple to start, a little weight on the F sharp. Special note F sharp, relax. Push, roll, relax. D sharp, D sharp. And relax. And we're now in the key of E major. At this point, I've actually marked in a piano uh, in terms of a dynamic. I don't believe there were any dynamics marked in the original score. On the harpsichord, you actually can't do dynamics because the mechanism doesn't allow for any variation of the plucking. Rather, texture, the amount of notes we used to have the feeling of loudness of a dynamic. But here on our instrument, I think we can take use of its extreme dynamic nuance and have a piano marked here because we suddenly go into this very distant world 
out of nowhere, we get uh, this beautiful C major, so C major seven harmony, which doesn't belong in either E major or A major. And it's just a lovely moment. So I think to accentuate that, to make it more expressive, uh, you can play it piano, maybe tasto. And I'm also holding down notes, so it's a little bit campanella as well. So we get, <laughs> it's a very uh, almost Brouwer-like harmony. Now in this section, we get a, a really clear build in terms of the chromatic line in the bass. That's moving uh, towards the next material, it's moving in that direction. We also get a really lovely sequence of syncopation. So syncopation, just to reiterate from the score uh, walkthrough, is the disturbance of an expected beat. So things don't fall where we think they're gonna fall. So let's, say, let's play this section without syncopation, it would sound like this. just not as interesting. Uh, Scarlett has done an amazing job here to do. You know, it's, it's beautiful. So in order for us to help that beauty come out, what I would suggest against is messing around too much with the rhythm here. As I said, there is plenty of room in this piece for cello rondo and ritardando and some rubato, but if you do it here in measure nine, uh, you're going to lose the effect of that syncopation. Let me give an example. If I move it around too much, suddenly the syncopation just seems to dissipate. You know, it's, I'm sure it has its own beauty, but we lose that um, rhythm that builds up and then adds to that forward motion. So try and keep this section nice and steady and building. So build it rather with the crescendo more so than doing anything with the rhythm. In fact, in the piano score crossing from measure nine to 10, we actually get thicker chords there. So it's an indication texture-wise that Scarlatti wanted uh, a growth in dynamic. Okay, so moving on. Now here we just have a lovely set of uh, rhythms where we have these ties that cross over the beat that so it really cascades and moves constantly forward and like we find in the second section we almost could stop here however we have what's called a um, deceptive cadence deceptive because it sounds like it's going to go to you know the home key but instead it goes to the six Extending. Now here it's sort of it's almost like a plagal religious cadence with a four three uh, suspension there. I mean he's gone. So more of those accented non chordal tones. The suspension, then. So I think putting in a tasteful accent on those notes really gives it a yearning feel and also uh, just a, a beautiful elegance to the line. You've probably heard me doing a lot of cross string trills in this example and uh, cross string trills I think are really quite appropriate for Scarlatti because unlike let's say uh, you know violin fugues from Bach's uh, sonatas and partitas, those, uh, the violin would really never make a, a trill that would use two strings like that. But in a harpsichord, they would have to alternate between two notes. And so I think, you know, not that we're trying, well, we can or we cannot, but we'd, we'd, I think it actually really is appropriate when dealing with this music, which was written for the, the keyboard, to use cross string trills here. And I actually, I don't know if it's a no-no or not, I will often mix uh, single string trills along with cross strings. But as, anyway, I said uh, I will deal with that in another video in the course, and I will. So let's move on now to the second section. <laughs> 